This is very cool. Our first hybrid. Wow. Oh yeah, roadshow. Okay, welcome everybody to the Sin City Social Club meeting for Friday, August thirteenth. Ready to go? Um, we're coming to you live from Las Vegas, where the big Star Trek convention is happening. Um, so we're doing our first ever hybrid show. We've got people here. You can see from the pen the screens. We've got people here in person. <laughs> and then we've got our regular Zoom logins. So we're really excited to see how this works and how long the uh, Wi Fi lasts. I'm going to go ahead and throw it over to Sid as is tradition. You guys are just amazing. All the different camera angles. It's like some sort of, it's wonderful. It's just amazing. It's wonderful. I can see so many people there too. <laughs> And I'm really glad that you managed to get all the technology working. I think that's just, um, it's, and, and hopefully you will stay online the whole time, but it, it's, it, it'll, it, it'll be a crapshoot. Is that, is that the right yeah. phrase? <laughs> Perfect. That's a, I think that's my Vegas phrase. I don't know how to play crap. I, it's a terrible name. Oh. Great. Well, it's good to see everyone. It's, I, I'm in sunny yeah. talents. It's not so sunny right now because it's actually very middle of the nighty. Um, so I should stop being really noisy, which I've actually started to be, you know, I've got some uh, uh, headphones on, which I should put on so I don't have to shout. And I'm really glad to see it. I'm a little bit delirious. My phone alarm went off at um, 1.45. <laughs> it went off again at 1.55. And then I was like, get out of bed, get out of bed, get out of bed. Um, so great, let's get going. This is fantastic. Um, so our first guest we have here, Dr. Mohammed Noor, who is a biologist from Duke University and also the chair of your department, correct? Actually, yeah. The dean. Was, the dean. The dean. I used to be chair. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> wow. Yeah. And what, what do you specialize in? So my specialties are genetics and evolution. So I both teach classes in genetics and evolution, and I have a research lab that uses fruit plants to try to understand evolutionary processes and like what makes new species form and things like that. Wow. <laughs> it's very cool. It's very cool. That is super cool. Yeah. <laughs> oh my goodness. So my Star Trek connection, it's funny, it's, it's been gradually growing more and more. So it's, it's infilt it hasn't infiltrated my research. I'm not actually doing that. <laughs> but on, on teaching and outreach. So I, I give talks at conventions on some of the real biology that underpins what you see in Star Trek. And I've been doing that now for about five years. Started at Dragon Con, actually, the year that I met you, sir. That was the first time I'd actually presented at a convention. So that's been great. Love that. Yeah, I've worked that into the classroom at Duke as well. Where actually, I, I used to teach a class just called Introduction to Genetics and Evolution. And, you know, it's just a, like basically a bio 101 for that half of biology. But uh, recently, I started this other version of it for non majors that's just called Genetics Evolution Star Trek. <laughs> and what I literally do in that, in that show is, I'm sorry, in that um, class is we'll watch bits of Star Trek episodes and I'll teach the concepts using those episodes. So we've watched, like, for example, Children of Time from Deep Space Nine. We'll use that to illustrate genetic drift. And, you know, various things come up through that. So that's been really fun. And then most- That is huge. <laughs> so I published a book also that, that uses these things too. It's called Live Long and Evolve, what uh, Star Trek can teach us about evolution, genetics, and life on other worlds. And that was wonderful. Princeton University Press was very gracious to publish that. <laughs> but I have that actually here at the convention too. But then most recently after the book came out, um, I got taken on as a uh, part-time uh, part science consultant for Star Trek Discovery. So I've been advising them on the science that then works later into my classroom. <laughs> so oh my really goodness. Fun. So I have this picture of you like with, with your fruit flies and uh, you're like, okay guys, you are the crew of the Enterprise. You're Scotty, you're Spock. Hey, no, no, you're Spock. <laughs> <laughs> they're all retro. They all, they all, not in 24 hours. That's like, a lot of people think that. A lot of people think three, five times 24 hours, but it actually takes them almost two weeks to even get to adulthood. Then they can live for months after that. So we, we tell them fast. They tend to be retro. For the big stone monster that they see when they go around the, around the rock or something. <laughs> you know, most college kids haven't seen that much Star Trek, but a lot of them still enroll for the class. They're still really interested, mostly because they like the idea of a narrative. It's supposed to just like, okay, let's talk about DNA, blah, blah, blah. Here's the four nucleotides. They like having a story to it. So, I mean, the enrollments have been pretty hot. 
so I, I do before and after surveys of the students and I'll ask them beforehand, you know, what was your, what's your thinking on biology? Do you think you want to take more classes? What do you think about Star Trek? Have you seen any things like that? And they, they all go up a lot between before and after, like ahead of time, you know, some of them are just taking to check off the science requirement. Um, most of them have never seen it. <laughs> but after a lot of them, like, I think biology is really cool. And yes, I want to watch a lot more Star Trek. <laughs> like, yeah, hey, win on both. <laughs> <laughs> it's fascinating watching their reactions, watching the, the episodes too. They, 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 you can see they're all seeing it for the first time. They're like, oh, they gasp and all of that. But the thing that struck me the most where I could see that they were actually getting hooked was um, on sometimes start an episode fairly late in class. And, you know, we're not supposed to spend most of the class time watching the episode. I'll often say at the end of the class period, like if you want to get up and leave, you can leave now, and, and you know the rest of it, you, you basically can figure it out. Very often, nobody leaves. They're like, no, I want to see the rest of it. <laughs> oh my goodness! What exactly is your field of research in terms with fruit flies? What what is it that you what 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 is it that you what, you, what do you do? Yeah, so basically, we want to understand what makes new species. So the first part of thinking about that is, you know, conceptually, what makes something a species? It means that you can interbreed, like there's a different parts of it can interbreed with each other. They're attracted to each other. The hybrids are fertile, things like that. So we basically dissect all those things. We'll take really closely related uh, fruit flies where those don't all apply. We basically try to understand what is what's the genetic basis of maybe the difference in pheromone or the difference in, you know, actually with one thing, the fruit flies I work with, they don't use so much, uh, they sometimes use pheromones, but what happens is the male, when he wants to uh, court a female, he'll come up and he'll, he'll just pretend you're a female fly. <laughs> okay, okay, guys, I think wing. maybe we should cover this. <laughs> <laughs> he'll, extend his wing and, he'll, he'll extend his wing and vibrate it and makes this very clear series of sound pulses that you can actually record with a good microphone. And one of these uh, we had a student do before was he cut off the wings of the flies and you play the song, we call it a song, of one fly species versus the other fly species. And you can see like, oh, the female recognizes that one and not the other based on whether she lets them mate with her or not. Oh That's my it's goodness. Yeah, it's bad. <gasps> Is there a difference? Do you find that there's a you, it has an impact on, on, on the fruit flies, um, for want of a better word, evolution? Being yeah. in a, this environment that in the or, or compared to what they would be outside, do you think this ah, is, this isn't definitely there have been a lot of studies that have shown that if you if you have them in a more complex setting, let's say like plants and dirt things like that, they don't necessarily behave exactly the same. So it, it's it's basically it's, we we do the best we can. <laughs> it's, it's a, That's it's amazing. A, and are kids really predisposed to the biology, or they or do you, I mean because I have a, a I mean a picture of like that's what they've come for. They haven't actually come going. Listen, we just we're kind of into Star Trek, but <laughs> yeah, we, we'll do a little biology. So I mean, there's a lot of who are pre-med or intended pre-med. So they're coming in, not necessarily excited about biology per se, but wanting to be a doctor. And you know, the, the goal then is to make them just appreciate biology more broadly, not just a specifically what can I apply, you know, how do I get a prescription to help this person with this disease? Try to get them a you know, broader view of, of biology, especially like genetics and evolution. So some are like yeah. that. Some of them are not biology, like especially for that Star Trek class, they're not. A lot of them are not biology majors or intended biology majors. They just have a natural sciences requirement. So they have to take some sort of biology or chemistry or physics or something like that to get their bachelor's degree. So at that point, they're like, why don't I take something fun? I don't want to take, you know, you know, no offense to organic chemistry, but they don't want to take an organic chemistry class. <laughs> <laughs> that is awesome. You've got a whole, whole bunch of people who spent a lot of time quite cloistered. And they're coming into a brand new world. And it's one of the most exciting. It's coming to college, coming to university. It's one of the best things in the world. And I, um, I, I only lasted a year, by the way. I, I totally <laughs> left after a few months. But you have that, com you've got those conversations that you, you're going to sort of be a kind of uncle figure to some of these people. Not all of them, admittedly, because there are thousands and thousands. And you've got to have these conversations about things that they they need to have conversations about. Is that awkward for you? Or because we've got quite a few professorial types and 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 well, professors, not professorial types, in the club here. Yeah. Do you, and I haven't really approached this subject with them. But not only are you coping with fruit flies, but how how is it coping with the students, and especially during this last year? That's a great question. So I mean, there's a mix. I mean, there are some students who actually I wish would reach out a lot more and talk to me more. I mean, it's very sad, for example, when I have somebody who's a senior and graduate and they ask me for a recommendation letter. And I said, you were in my 300 person class. I never said a word to you until now. I can list your grade yeah. in the recommendation letter, but that's not very helpful. So I actually, I, I honestly wish more, more of them would reach out more. But if it's on a topic, let's say, for example, if they're talking about faith in relation to evolution, 
I don't find it awkward because I'm probably because I'm used to that. And I know this is a conversation that comes up a lot and I'm comfortable having that conversation. Sometimes as you, as you might imagine, like you said, um, some students have you know, personal issues that are maybe completely unrelated to class and they're just looking for somebody to talk to. And sometimes depending on the specifics of what those conversations can be, they sometimes can get a little bit awkward. And sometimes I have to stop them and say, look, I have to warn you, if you tell me any more about this, you know, if, if it's going in a particular direction, I might have to stop and say, if you tell me anything more about this, I may have an obligation to report it. So you should yeah. decide now what you want to talk to me about, or otherwise here's some other resources you could use. Yeah. And are you all back at, are you all back at school? Yes, actually Duke, uh, for the last year, I think probably about maybe 15, 20% of classes were in person and the rest were online. But the in-person ones, it was all masked and social distance. Duke did a fantastic job, I have to say, with testing. They basically had every undergrad test maybe three times a week for all the wow. lab. They came up with a really good new high throughput uh, DNA sequencing. As a geneticist, I was very excited about that. I had a approach for doing this. So, and we actually had very low numbers relative to a lot of universities nearby. And what, what's your impression of Vegas this year? Of Vegas? Uh, it's actually, yeah. yeah, the convention is pretty good. I've noticed the, the compliance is pretty high. I mean, I've seen, you know, every now and then you get the kind of the math to slip a little bit or things like that. But generally speaking, I feel like people are taking the spirit of it pretty well and, and doing what they need to do. Can you describe to us, because a lot of us haven't been there and nor will we ever get there, what, what, what it's like, what's the vibe, what's, what, how many people are there, what, what is, is there Star Trek on every floor, is, what, what's going on? That's a great question. Do you want me to do that? Or okay. I, in theory, anybody here can do that. <laughs> uh, it's, for those who've been to conventions before, it's not all that different, except for the fact people are masked and there's always this awkwardness of, am I allowed to shake your hand or not? <laughs> there's all that, or do you do the elbow bump, things like that. There's a little bit of that. In terms of just the way it's set up, I mean, there, in the main, there's a big main auditorium and there's, there's programming in there all the time. I don't think there was any spacing or anything like that set up at all. Like it's just, it's just assigned seats throughout there. So people just sit wherever they're gonna sit. Everybody has to yeah. wear masks all the time. It is, there is a requirement to either be vaccinated or to come in with a negative test and have a second negative test halfway through the halfway through the period. And Good. They have, they have to, I think it's the orange band that says that you're vaccinated or, or similar. Um, wow. And in terms of the interactions, I mean, you know, people are having fun. They're going around. They're going. They're going to the little uh, snack areas. There's there's less eating and drinking in general, but there's not none. I mean, karaoke has <laughs> been canceled and was replaced with bingo, which is a little bit funny, but it was cool. <laughs> yeah. There's a lot Gosh. Of <laughs> oh my goodness. And what's your cosplay choice this, this weekend? So I'm, I'm giving a panel later this afternoon with uh, Jamie Brook, who's an actress in Star Trek Discovery. So I'm going to switch out of this into a, a Discovery uniform. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> Make her feel at home. Exactly. Exactly. That's fantastic. Yeah. Brilliant. Mohammed, that's so wonderful. Oh, cool. <laughs> I'm hogging you. I'm hogging you. What? Oh. What? What? There must because you got you got fourteen. I don't know. What does it look like? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Something like six or seven people in there. Um, because I, I. But I want to hear from all of you. Yeah. I, who's Who's in there? Yeah. Who's Who's got a question? Who's state, your, state your name. Social security number. <laughs> <laughs> I have a question. I always have questions. This is, um, okay. This is Casey. Hello. Hi, Casey. Hi. What is the pretend science that you have advised about that you're the most excited about real world sort of hype for, applications for? Sure. So, so some of the things I did, I did uh, collaboratively with Dr. Erin McDonald. Dr. Erin McDonald is the science advisor for the Star Trek universe. I like to say she's the sheriff of science for Star Trek. I was somebody who was deputized to help out, <laughs> just to make that clear. So we worked together on Discovery Season 3 on basically the science behind the burn. So I can talk a little bit about just the biology half, but that would be awkward because more of it is probably physics than biology. But I did also in Season 3 of Discovery, I can't talk about anything going forward, but in Season 3 of Star Trek Discovery, uh, uh, in episode five, there was a there was a thing where the, um, the Enterprise, or sorry, not the Enterprise, the Discovery had just gotten to the space station, and there was an alien species that was being treated on the space station. They had some disease, and that was something where they actually asked me to do a solo consult on that, asking to say, okay, we have we have some specifics here. This has to be something based on the food that they've eaten. We're going to have to have them go find a seed ship, and somehow or another, that's going to help find a cure. It can't be communicable. And they had this whole list of things, and they said, okay. Science that, like, what is the disease <laughs> associated with that? <laughs> so, what I, what I picked for that was to use a prion, 
P R I O N. So I thought prions are perfect because I mean you get them from things that you eat. It's not communicable. It's not like you can just touch somebody who has prions and you get prions yourself. But they're terrible. Like if you go to the CDC website, look up prion diseases. It says there's no cure. We just try to make you comfortable before you die. I mean, so they're, they're <laughs> terrible disease. So it's things like mad cow disease. If you remember mad cow back in the 1980s, it, the solution was kill all the cows that had it. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Well, yeah, it's not much better for. Them. I mean, they don't kill the people, but it's, unfortunately, it's not much better for people. Who have it. <laughs> oh anyway, my goodness! I came up with a little bit of a storyline collaboratively with them. It wasn't solo me, but collaboratively with the writers, we came up with a little bit of a storyline for how uh, the seeds would actually connect to finding a cure for doing that. So, but that was really fun. I really enjoyed that. Awesome. Thank you. Thanks, a great wow. Who else has a question? I'm trying to remember the name of the. Fly. Isn't there a fly down um, South Africa that seems like Bot flies. Yes. yes. <laughs> My PhD advisor had one that laid the egg in his head. <laughs> and it was funny, of course, as a biologist, he's like, I don't want to take it out. So he <laughs> let it go through the full cycle. Oh. <laughs> and then like, you actually, if you search online, you can actually find him talking on a radio show about this. His name was Jerry Coyne, C O Y N E. But uh, he let the fly go through the full cycle, and eventually a little adult fly popped out of the top of his head and flew off. It's above and beyond. Whoa! Yeah. Yeah. Jennifer's got a hand up. Hello, everybody. Um, Hi, Jennifer. Hello, Seth. Thank you, first off, Doctor, for being um, part of this extravaganza IRL. In real life, I'm a pastor. And so I was very delighted about the pieces that you were talking about when science and, and faith can coexist and, and not terribly, which they did for a long time. But anyway, I'm curious because in, in I can see that coming up in college classes and university classes because that's when a lot of people are going through really first tearing apart their own ideas. I'm curious if that comes up for you in spaces like being on, working on discovery or in, in the more sort of adult Trek spaces, if that's a conversation that you run into fairly regularly? That's a great question. So first on the first part, I'm, I'm honored to be here. So thank you all for having me. <laughs> but <laughs> with respect to the Trek, Trek actually has been amazingly good about accepting the truth of evolution pretty much from the beginning. So I mean, there's some like terrible, Terrible in terms of the science, not terrible in terms of the quality. There's a, like the, the episode from the next generation, Genesis, where they devolved into like primates and amphibians. <laughs> I mean, on the one hand, it was, it was like, what, what on earth is happening here? But on the other hand, they were very explicit about the fact that we are related to all those other types. So they're right off the bat accepting evolution as, as true there. There's also the episode from the next generation, The Chase, where they try to explain all alien life as being all related, things like that, which presupposes that not only would aliens be, uh, be related, but presumably everything on Earth would also be related too. So to some extent, Star Trek has just always just accepted that from the very beginning. There's also like passing comments. So in, in Deep Space Nine, uh, in the finale of the first season, there was a discussion there about the, the wormhole and Keiko, how she was teaching the wormhole and things like that. And um, Keiko made a comment to Kai Wynn saying, well, what about things like teaching evolution? And Kai Wynn's response was, I mean, I think she was still Vedic with them. The Vedic Wynn's response at the time was, we'll cross that bridge when we come to it. And she's like, no, I teach science. The answer is no, I'm going to teach it the way it is. And that was definitely portrayed as the right answer. So there hasn't been anything like that so much with respect to evolution in particular. So that's not that I've seen. It's been very wholeheartedly accepting, which actually makes it very easy to teach evolution then using uh, Star Trek. But, uh, but honestly, even the places where Star Trek sometimes gets things wrong, like the, the de-evolving episode I mentioned earlier, it's still instructive because it often reflects common misconceptions. So I can still teach using that saying, hey, look, people often think this and you can see it portrayed here. However, in reality, this is why that doesn't work exactly right. And kudos to the writers that they always at least try. You can always see the basis of what they were trying to do. There's rarely anything where it's just like, where did that come from? It's more like they did something, but they reflect, you know, something that very often people get wrong. So. Wow. <laughs> I, 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 who's that just come in? Hi. <laughs> who's, lurking? who's lurking in the background? Oh. <laughs> It's, I thought I recognized you, Andy, even behind a mask, even in the doorway from a mile away. Are, are you in Romania? You know, I, those places? I'm in, I'm in Bangkok. I know. It's crazy, isn't it? It's a crazy world. 
Oh my God. <laughs> uh, so Mohammed has several panels happening. Tell us, um, you've got one more today. One more uh, just one more today. So okay. I, I had two earlier. The first one I had was uh, why are there human so many humanoids in Star Trek? Which is basically an <laughs> evidence for evolution talk, evolutionary processes, and, uh, and addressing the, the ways those were brought up in various Star Trek episodes. The second was genetics, genetic ancestry testing, race, and Star Trek. And that was the one I did yesterday. So it was a lot about what, how to direct direct to consumer genetic ancestry tests work. So things like ancestry DNA or 23, 23andMe. And why do they not actually tell you what you think they're telling you? And then the one today is, um, what's it called? Oh, Biotrek with the Admiral, same as my podcast. Okay. So that's the one on basically science in all three seasons of Star Trek Discovery. So that one I'm doing together with Jane Brooke. Oh my goodness. Yeah. Very that nice. is fantastic. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Oh my God. Thank you. 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 Yeah. <laughs> yeah, you didn't. Oh, well, now, now I'm okay. I'm on familiar territory. Right now. Yeah. <laughs> it's good to see you, bro. It's good Same to see here. you, brother. Thank you. It really is. How are you? You know, I mean, oh, that's such a loaded question. It is. It is. Oh, Careful how you answer that. Been, Let me. I'll, I'll be honest with you. It's been really difficult. Uh, it's been a bummer. Please. And, you know, and, but the thing is, there is a silver lining. I mean, you know, uh, so, so all of this, but it's like, it's been hard. Okay. And, and, but, oh, I, but, brought, and I brought the vibe, <laughs> right? No, no, no. It's important though. It's important that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Which is when I was at Lambda, I don't know if they were still doing this when you were, were at Lambda, but when I was at Lambda, we put together two one act plays. Uh, a, a, a Strindberg and a Shaw, it was an odd combo, but I guess it was to accommodate the, you know, the, the 10 of us. And then we took it on tour, would you believe, to the Southwest, to Devon and Cornwall, and Totnes, which is this place called Darlington Hall, was one of the stops, you know? <laughs> oh my goodness. <laughs> in, in, in 1964, so it was, you know, hilarious. Wow. Wow. So yes, it's I, we're gonna go there on September 10th, and I'm going, we're going to Totnes. Oh, that's fantastic. How long are you at the convention for? And I what mean, are your times? Three days is it for me. Yeah. That's as much as I can do, you know, and and plus this is the first time I you know, I I I I've been sequestered for you know for nearly two years. And you know, and we all got the virus too. That's part of it. So that was like, you know, a lot of fun. So to come out of that and into, you know, this place was, you know, it's <laughs> Oh, well, we're certainly so happy to see you. I'm certainly so happy to see you. Gosh. I was thinking about you just today, and beca partly because I'm reading in the news about Portland, um, but also partly because um, I, I, something I'm gonna, I'll tell, I'll talk to you about it later. It's about a stitch in time, um, but it's, it's, I, we have a deep, someone, I'll, I'll tell you, I'll tell you all about it later. Someone's been hard, tr hard, trying very hard to get a hard copy, hardcover copy of the book. You know, somebody um, here, somebody came to my table yesterday and put down a copy. And I just said, oh, oh, you know, where'd you get this? Thinking that I'm, he got it from a vendor here who sold it to, and was actually to a, a, a woman, sold it to her for 30 bucks. That is a bargain. No, it, because... it really is. I mean, it's a, a huge bargain. So I don't know if this vendor is still around or this vendor suddenly woke up and realized, what the hell did I just do? <laughs> Oh my goodness! Yes, it's going on 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 some, some websites for two hundred and something dollars for that particular book right yeah. now. We have the, this copy Just, is in our our benefit auction, donated by Mark. Oh, fantastic. <laughs> unsigned, but oh, oh, currently. Oh, oh, there you go. <laughs> so, so I, I, I'll just sign it, you Garrick, right? Yeah, I think everybody knows this. <laughs> Don't be a wise ass, Mel. Oh, sorry. <laughs> You're all step back. I don't want no, to no, step you on your can, toes. I know, uh, please. 
more than Bill. Jenny's <laughs> uh, one of the best sparring partners. <laughs> I never win. No, <laughs> but, no, no. Thank you. I'm the least, believe me, I'm the least competitive person. I, <laughs> um, I think Serena with her hand up. Are you going to make us all cry again? Yeah, uh, I hope not. This time I have good news. Tell us. Oh, Irena! <laughs> oh my God, it's you! Yes, it's me! It's you, it's in Scotland. Oh my dear, hello! Oh Hi. my dear, you're one of the most amazing people I've ever not met. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, in the flesh, that is, I'm speaking. Uh, if, yes! I was supposed to meet you in London at the convention this July, but it was cancelled. It's postponed until November. So you could technically still make it I'm if you want. I'm in the UK. I don't, know. I, I don't know how long we're going to stay. But anyways, I'm living for the day when I meet you in person. And I, I'm like trying to get up the courage to tell you, can we just go for a pint somewhere? <laughs> <laughs> for you, yes. I will. Oh. I will. <laughs> but anyway, I came here to share the news with you and Sid and, and uh, the entire club. Some of the people in the club know already, but I wanted to share with everyone that I applied for a postgraduate acting um, course at Napier University in Edinburgh, and I got accepted. Oh my God! Congratulations! <laughs> so you're looking at a oh. master's students for acting for acting for stage and screen it's the that is huge program. so when, when do you start in less than a month i'm super excited and very nervous and we already have an audition on like september the 10th why do you have an audition if you've already been accepted no no we have an audition internally because they have directing students and they want to know what they have to work with sort of i see, to see how to cast us and stuff that's right so yeah. Don't wow. think about an audition. I'm very nervous, and I got a friend think of mine. That's why, because you're nervous because you're thinking of it as an audition. You're going to go, Irena, listen to me now. <laughs> listen to me. Listen to Uncle Andy. You're <laughs> just going to go there. I mean this. I mean this from my heart. You're going to go there, and you're going to play. That's all you're going to do. You're going to play. Because there's nobody like you. You don't have to prove anything. You don't have to be anything that you're not. You're just going there to play at something that you love to do. Okay? Fantastic. Yeah, okay. absolutely true. <laughs> you always make me cry. <laughs> so, yeah, I, I wanted true. to share good news, but I ended up crying. Big surprise. <laughs> <laughs> great news. It's great news right now. That really is great news. So, yeah, I'm just glad. I love Edinburgh, by the way. I have some good news. I got a book finished. And I finished my book last week. And the publishing company that I most wanted to get this book with, because it's an acting book, is yeah. Rutledge, uh, the Rutledge oh. publishers who are in Oxford. So I'm, I'm, and I have an editor there now. And so if we get up to Oxford, you know, I don't see why we shouldn't just go all the way up to Edinburgh. Yes, Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. Yes, that would be amazing. Thank you, Rada. Congratulations. Thank Congratulations. You. I'll, I'll let somebody else gush at Andy now. <laughs> <laughs> no more gushing. <laughs> Lisa, do you have a question? I, I do. Um, when you were trying to get roles after playing the Scorpio killer, I just how difficult that was because people kept associating you with that with that character. And I just I can't I just was wondering if you mind telling that story again if it hasn't been told to mm. before. No, I mean it, it, back in, in I think 71 when I when I made that film, it was the um, it was kind of the role. Of, of this insane psychopath was, you know, there weren't a lot of them. I mean, now it, it's all, you know, psychotic killers and that kind of violence is in our face. You know, it's, it's amazing. So we just, oh yeah, another one of those. The stakes have to be constantly raised to scare us or, or whatever it is, you know, 
add to our paranoia. Um, but that was like one of the first. And, and so when I did that, and, and I, you know, I, I went there, I, you know, I was, so that's how I was taught, you know, that if you're gonna play a role, you go there. And, and, and I had a great time because the other thing is, is that I, you know, I, I always had such rage, you know, especially as a young man and, uh, and, and anger. And I found such a therapeutic outlet when I was playing the Scorpio killer. And it was, it was releasing. It was actually joyful. And because I could do this, it was safe. That's what they were paying me a thousand dollars a week, which I thought was an amazing amount of money <laughs> uh, and to do. And, and, and they liked what I was doing. So I was like, that was great. But then, you know, after that, it was like nothing for a year, except people saying how I scared them, how I gave them nightmares. And then I thought, oh, wait, this is a truly a double-edged sword, uh, you know, this, this acting. And honestly, this, that's when I first, you know, became aware that acting is not an innocent enterprise. I mean, it, it has consequences and uh, it, it, it does change. Uh, it changes things, so or it has the possibility of changing things. So yeah. Yeah. When I started getting hired again, I mean, because I was broke, <laughs> the, you know, a thousand dollars a week for eight weeks only goes for so long, and and so it, when it, the only thing I was getting offered were these these poor, sad imitations of the Scorpio killer. It's like, and, and the carbon copy was beginning to like get fainter and fainter. And, <laughs> until finally I was, there was one day uh, I was doing an episode of the show called The A-Team. <laughs> and I was sitting in the San Fernando Valley. It was in the middle of summer. I had a, I had a, I was dressed at a tie and a suit and a jacket. And I was outside and they, they were served, you know, at lunch, and they were serving this awful catered meal. And I'm looking at my plate, and the mashed potatoes were melting. And I realized how much I hated what I was doing. So that's I quit. I quit acting, and and I just went away. And, I, and we moved up to the mountains, and for you know, for four years. And that's when I started teaching. And uh, and and then when I to make a long story short, <laughs> please do. Uh, I, when I came back to LA and started acting again, that's you know I was revitalized. I, I found got past that thing. But yeah, that was a uh, it was it was uh, challenging. What brought me back was a stage play that became this huge hit. That's based on a real story of this man who. Uh, by the name of Jack Henry Abbott, who wrote this book called In the Belly of the Beast. And he was a, he was a killer, but he was a real, a real person, as I say, who was a brilliant man and a great writer, but totally twisted. And, uh, and so it was this stage play that brought me back. Tell us another question. More of a comment. A lot of people know, I came out as non-binary not too long ago. And I was trying to find a name to replace a certain name I had before. And I, um, I went to a certain name at the time because the doctor goes against the type, the gender type for quite often. And then you know, he's an officer when um, it's normally a female scientist, but instead of male, and he also rebuilt himself after he was broken. So I just wanted to say thank you. Oh my God, that, when you said that name, I said, what's that name? <laughs> <laughs> oh, wow. Because you made it up. Oh, wow. <laughs> oh. Now, oh. now you have an ape. <laughs> that's, that's what is extraordinary. <laughs> 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 you got him. You got, got him. him. I'm getting out of here. This is good. <laughs> <laughs> uh. You're welcome. <laughs> Who wants to follow that? <laughs> <laughs> so uh, yeah, I, I wanted to ask, like, um, I, I struggle a lot with like burnout and keeping drive, and you're doing all sorts of amazing stuff all the time. So that's like, how do you keep that drive momentum going? 
Oh, I mean, <laughs> that's that's the sixty-four dollar question. I mean, <laughs> it's, it's it's. I mean, what 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 choice do we have? What is your name? Okay. What choice do we have? I mean, what choice do we have? I mean, I I don't understand what this life is about. I honestly, I don't, I don't, I don't know why we're here. I'm an atheist. I I don't believe in an afterlife or that there's some some old guy with a white beard who's you know if I do what he says in this from this book that that's, um, that's, it's all going to be okay for me. I have no idea, but I do know that life is precious. I I do know that, and especially when you have children, grandchildren. You know, and 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 you see, you know, and and you see life growing. It's like it's precious. And yeah. so, I mean, there are times I've, yeah, I mean, you know, get depressed, and you know, and 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 I'll be very honest, you know, that you know, I'm getting, I'm going to be 80 on my next birthday, and and it's like, wow, what used to be this magnificently functioning machine is is not magnificent and 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 altogether functioning. The way it is, and so you know, I'm I'm sort of like so I I'm living with death, and I can't not talk about that, you know. And you yeah. ask if you ask me to come up here and so forth, I'm not going to come up and tell you stories about Deep Space Nine <laughs> because I I don't remember what happened except I love I love love playing Garrick and I met Sid, you know. That's what I remember, you know. So it's like it, it's like we just have no choice but to keep moving forward. And in my in my teaching, as and I know in my listen, you know, I started this conservatory program knowing that that ninety five percent of the people in the program will not make their living as professional actors. So then, how do you justify start you know creating a program like this? And it was very simple. For me, acting is about learning how to become a human being. It was, that's what it always was. Even when I didn't know that, it was like learning for you learn how to use your body and how to speak and so forth at the beginning. And, you know, and, and we all, we start out wanting to be an actor because, for, you know, for a lot of reasons, me, because I had my childhood, which was, was and, you know, and, and I wanted some attention. I wanted people to be kind to me. I wanted some, you know, some kind of, you know, affirmation. You know, and then it it, 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 it it went from there. It was like, oh, what it is, finally, when, you know, in this teaching that helped me un come to this place is that it's like learning how to use this instrument. And the instrument includes my soul as well as my mind and, and, and my body and how to find the unity there. And and that's, that, that, that for me is, 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 is what keeps me moving ahead. I uh, recently, during the pandemic, did a lot of online improv, and that helped me find my voice and helped me like, learn to communicate with people better in general. Yeah, exactly. That's that's very important, as you just said, because you know the voice if the, if, with the school that Sid and I went to, Lambda. It was a wonderful school. Mainly, it was because from when I when I went there it was because of this woman Iris Warren, who created this voice program that then Kristen Link later you know later came to America and started teaching. But that was you know the voice you know up until that point voice teaching was about how to sound really good and round your vowels <laughs> and, and, and speak like an actor. Whereas Iris Warren said, you have to speak like a human being. And in order to speak like a human being, you have to speak from where you live and who you are. You have to speak from your soul, you know, and, and, and to tell the truth isn't just reciting facts. It's, it's speaking from who you are. So yeah, that's, that, that's really important. I had a I had a word one word on my the inside of my trailer door which I would leave every time I went to set, and the word I saw on my trailer door which I had written in a sharpie was voice, and then I went to work and that was like ten times a day. Had yeah. to remind myself of that. That's where I had to start the performance. Sid, was was John McLeod still teaching voice when you were there? No, it was Pamela Barnard. 
who was yeah. teaching voice so when John I was there. McLeod, he was the McLeod of McLeods, of, you know, it, it, he was- uh, Of the, the clan McLeod. That's right, <laughs> he really was. And we once went to the Isle of Skye to visit Dun in Dunvegan where his castle was, but he wasn't there. But he was a wonderful teacher. I, I was wondering if you, he, he taught you because he just died. Oh, yeah, we had, we had, a, why are you, we had a, <laughs> he must have taught you, is that the, no. I guess, so. <laughs> yeah, we had a wonderful uh, lady called Pamela Barnard, who was probably, she was, a. I, I would say when we were there, she was in her, probably her 60s, but we were 20, so we thought, we thought she was in her hundreds. But right. she was probably in her sixties, and um, she was a she was very she was all mana la da ba za mana la da. You know, she was all about doing these voice exercises again and again for hours and hours and hours. But she was wonderful. She was one very old fashioned, and she had that rather shrill voice that uh, was very uh, famous for, for women in, in, in the, at that particular time. Um, it was uh, what we call blue stocking in oh, in, yes. in the in the parlance. Uh, okay, we've got several hands up on the screen. Um, Amy Doodles. I was wanting to say, Andy, I'm so glad you're our uncle, and now you're my uncle, and so, which is really great because I never really had an uncle. So there you go. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Thank you very much for being you, all of you, the way you are, and your home is your soul. Oh, we love you too, Amy. All right, and we've got Harris. So I, I wasn't intending to speak today. Hi, everyone. Um, Hi, Harris. So after what Kella shared, I thought I would also share something that might make Andy cry about gender and Garak. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so I'm I'm also non-binary, um, and I've been out for a long time. Well, one of my middle names is Elim um, because he's Garrick is very important to me. Um, he's a, a role model of someone who gets it wrong and I think is trying to put it right and trying to right the wrongs that he's done and that's very important to me. Um, he sort of gets redemption in the kind of post canon arc with the books and that's a nice thing to hang on to um and um i don't know if you can see i don't know how the light is but i have some tailor scissors and oh yes this yeah. line here yes yeah so, wow yeah, it's important to me in my gender and like right he's a model of masculinity maybe when my um appointment with the ni nhs gender identity service rolls around, I'll take a picture of him and say, can you turn me into a lizard? <laughs> <laughs> we'll see how brave I'll be. So, yeah, so thank you. Oh, thank you. <laughs> but you know, the scissors, you know, and that's also about discriminating, you know, cutting away what's no longer necessary to, you know, yep. getting, rid of, get, getting rid of the old baggage, you know, what, what um, there's a, there's a great, um, Hebrew word called the clippet that happens during the holy days, and it, and it's about it, the souls. It, it's about shells of the dead, and 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 that those dead things that we carry that we just have to get rid of. Yeah, yeah. with you with you on that. Thanks, Harris. Mars Hi. has a question back behind the laptop. <laughs> Oh, oh Mars, there you are. Hi. Hi. Yes, I have a philosophical one. I've been asking a lot of people throughout the pandemic. Do you like yourself more or less of a thing than you did one year ago? Wow. Oh, wow. Oh, that's I think good question. That's great. That's great. She beats it to the question. <laughs> Mars, that's a great question. I, I like myself more. Good. And while I was going through that, I was not liking myself very much because I was having some very dark thoughts that I had to deal with. I really had to deal with it. I couldn't just fake it, you know, because there was some fundamental things in me that were being so challenged that either I dealt with them or I just quit, you know? So yeah, for me, it, it's like, this whole thing, boy, it, it really has just, you know, just up against the wall, mother. <laughs> you 
you know? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Same question, Sid. Oh boy. Um, <laughs> I don't know. I mean, I, I, that's a, that's not a dodge. I'm going to try and get to it by saying, but I'm going to give buy myself a little time by saying I don't know. Um, I, I think probably. I think probably more. I mean, I, 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 I'm I'm one of those people who is very careful about judging myself in in positive way. So my uh, ultimate my 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 in inclination is to say the same or less. But um, I, I would, I'd have to say more. I'd have to give myself a, a, a just to say I, I, there are things about that I've discovered about myself that I that I like, um, but they're based, pri pr I think, primarily on my ability to tap into some truth that I maybe have, have avoided for a long time. There's a re few relationships that um, I'm 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 happier about, um, and I feel that I'm going to build on now because of the last couple of years. Um, uh, one of which is probably my son. I'm a kind of I'm a lovely guy, but that doesn't pave over the fact I may not be a nice dad. Uh, and I've got I could do better, and we've had a little talk about that. So that that's unusual for me to make those sort of leaps because when you think of yourself as a nice guy, apart from the the sort of I guess the the narcissism that lies behind that particular phrase you tend to give yourself a break on just about everything else and so I'm that's that's no longer a facade I can hide behind that's I think that's something that I'm figuring that's out that's beautiful <laughs> Sid what's your question Sid yeah 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 <laughs> no, no. <laughs> You know, we should we should definitely do something else. That's for sure. Um, yeah, the, you know, uh, I, I'm 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 game. In all your free time there in Thailand, <laughs> I'm sitting around on my big rear end here. That's all I do. Um, let's see. We've got Ash with a hand up. Let's see what Ash has to say. Hi. Hello. Hey, Ash. Um, there was a thing on YouTube that I saw recently where. Um, an interview on YouTube where you mentioned that um, playing Garrick may have cured your claustrophobia. I don't know how it happened, but it was like that. Uh, that was their idea. Because the thing, the thing that was so ironic about that, that when I got hired to do the show, I mean, I had no idea what I was getting into. No idea. Here, here I am. See, I'm sitting here and talking to you all like this. You know, I mean, it's like oh, Jesus that, because of this character. I thought I was just going to do an episode, you know, and do an episode of television, which I've done countless, you know, episodes of television. And then when I sat in the makeup trailer, and and, and there was call like like the, the call was like for about two or three o'clock in the morning because it was a four hour makeup job. And then, the, and as the makeup job was going on, I got more and more tense, really tense. I was like so nervous about this. And then when they put the wig on, it was like, that was the sealer. It was like, at least the top of my head was free. And then they put the wig on. And I, I thought, this is really creepy. This is awful. And then, 
because they wanted the Cardassians to look big. They made the costumes out of furniture pads, it, was, it felt like. It wasn't furniture pads, but it was heavy, heavy material. And then they put that on me. I really, really wanted to call my agent and say, you know, how, how do I just, can I, and I knew it was too late, uh, the whole thing. And, but then, and, and then, and this is absolutely true. I looked in the mirror and I saw Garrett. And I didn't have to do any acting. The character was there. It was all there. I can't do Garrick without without all of that. Then they come up with that episode about Garrick being uh, claustrophobic. And I thought, well, this this is rich. <laughs> <laughs> A little too close to real life. Yes. Yeah. Uh, space Bash. All right. Karen is up late or early, depending on your perspective. Not 20 to 11, it's okay. <laughs> not too bad, not too shabby. I actually had a question for Andy, and I'm trying not to be too starstruck. <laughs> good, good, go, go, go. <laughs> okay, uh, hi, Andy. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> <laughs> I'm rereading A Stitch in Time. I have several questions. <laughs> <laughs> Um, the, 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 the <laughs> okay, yeah, go ahead. <laughs> you know, in, in, the, in the very beginning, in the, with the Bamaran um, scenes, it's about Garrick learning to find his, his space. And that, that really, it so much resonated with me because I was like, when I was a teenager, like, girl, I was super, super shy and I was basically always overlooked. I don't know, like, even if I tried to. To participate in a group and even if i tried to be part of a group i was always just not there and and when i when i read your description of like finding finding your space and like inhabiting the space you actually physically inhabit and that i don't know it, it just somehow clicked for me so and I, I'm, I'm not an not an actor I'm, like, I'm a biologist i have no idea about acting or art in general so i was wondering is that like an um is that a thing you came up with yourself, or is that like an acting technique? No, no, no. That 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 was my that was my childhood. That was my childhood. Oh. Was ten, ten years old, I was taken. The state took me away from my mother, who was very sick, and uh, and and I was sent to this uh, church industrial school in New England, this boys' mm -hmm. school. And uh, ten years old, there I was, and uh, I, and I, I had no idea who I was. I had no idea why I was there. I had no idea who these other people were. Uh, I, you know, and uh, and I was suddenly given these rules, and and I had to go to church a couple times a week, and and I had to do, I had to work there, uh, you know, and um, and I, you know, it was like it was insane. So all of that Bamaran thing came from that experience. And, you know, and, and essentially, you know, there's, you know, we're, we're, we're all of us, all of us go through that. You know, it's not just bizarre circumstances. All of us, you know, we wake up, you know, at one point, we, we gain a certain amount of consciousness, maybe after puberty or something. You look around and you think, who, who am I? What am I doing here? And who are these people that, that, that oh, yes. well, my family, you know, and, and whatever. And uh, and and it, it's sort of like, and then you have to become a spy. In a sense, you're a spy. And, and and everybody, you know, you know, it's like you're spying. You're not telling people what you're thinking or feeling. I mean, that's that that's often just dangerous and you know, and it sets you up for ridicule or worse. So you just pretend, you know, and you, you take in information and then you find your openings, you find your space, you know, and you, and you find how you can sort of like, okay, I can, I can do this, I, you know, I can be that and, and what people expect of you. It's, you know, it's, we all go, you know, that's, that's the thing about, you know, I, I would, if I could, I don't think I have any of it, I would write more fiction if I could. But I I shot my wad for the stitch of time. That was it. I told that's my story. 
I, that's my story, you know, and I'm sticking to it, you know, but I, I have no other story to tell. And so I, I've, I've tried, I've tried to, you know, to write other things, but, you know, but it all comes off as, you know, oh my God, that's funny. That's, that's, I have no idea what I'm talking about there. It's funny, you know, because a lot of actors love, a lot of people love acting um, because they get to be honest <laughs> when <laughs> they're acting. <laughs> it, it's so right on. Absolutely. Absolutely. And uh, Annie, I, I also like, I, I really like the, the passage about that. What people lie about tells you almost as much as if they would tell you the truth. And okay. yeah. Great. It's, so it's, it's such a wonderful book, really. It's yeah, you know, it's, that, that that was that was that's the writers of DS9. Because the writers gave me that character and mm -hmm. and and those insights about about truth and lies. It's really wonderful. I have one last question before I, I give the mic to someone else. We we all know that there are a lot of different stories flying around on why Garrick was exiled. And like you, you present another one in the in in a stitch in time, and I always wondered, did you intend for that to be the truth or just uh, your truth? Like the, the, oh. the story. <laughs> <laughs> what was the story? <laughs> Would you like to elaborate? Yeah, tell tell yes. me what was the story I came up with in the stitch in time. As far as I understood, um, it uh -huh. was the story that you fell in love with Palandine and oh. then murdered her husband <laughs> or had him murdered. I'm, I, I'm only like in part two. I love that. That's great. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. That's so Gary. Absolutely. Yes. Information. That's so Gary. I know. You know, because no, you know, walking away, it's so funny because walking away from the whole series and everything that's going on in my life. You know, and, and I was thinking about, I don't know why I was thinking about this just recently. So why is Garrick on Deep Space Nine? You know, I'm thinking, it's because as, as I've always said, it would be like, it would be like, you know, a member of the SS or the Wehrmacht right after the World War II going to Jerusalem, you know, and, and becoming a tailor, you know, in, in, the, in the old city or something. You know, I'm saying that's really weird. And so my I always thought it was because he he crossed his father and his his and, and basically that was it. You know, he crossed in Tain, uh and uh and, and 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 he would if he wasn't if he hadn't been Inabrin Tain's son, he would have been executed. So he was just exiled and exiled to the worst possible place where people were just gonna despise him. At least there was a very handsome doctor. Huh? Didn't work out as much. It didn't work out as much. <laughs> Garrick was a smart guy. Yeah. That's <laughs> much smarter than I am. They didn't yeah. count on him being so likable. That's it. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Th thank you very much, Andy, for, for your performance for yeah, for everything. You're welcome. Thank you. I, I I hope you will you will be able to attend the con uh, convention of, in November in London. I got a ticket. You know, you know something? Uh because it, it's the one that was canceled, right? I guess it was moved. Oh, yes. postponed. Yeah. So if it's that one, if I'm still in England, I don't know because Irene, we're, we're we're just leaving an open end because Irene wants promised little Willie Cosmo, our our grandson, our beautiful grandson, mm -hmm. uh, who's five years old. She promised him that she would show him Paris, mm -hmm. and and so he says whenever he you know talks to her now, he says now Bubby, remember. Mm -hmm. We're going to Paris. Of course, no. Willie has no idea what Paris is. But, <laughs> but, but Irene promised him that they would go to Paris. So, you know. <laughs> promising a five-year-old is an ironclad. <laughs> and she also <laughs> promised him that she's going to buy him a red car. Oh. Yeah. Did she specify how big the car would be? Yeah. No, no, she did. So when you know, when she we, when he was in Los Angeles before they went to England, um, we'd be walking down the street or someplace, and and whenever Irene would see a red car, 
she'd say, is that the one, Willie? And he'd say, no, that's not it. <laughs> then I think he saw this Volkswagen hatchback of all things, you know? And I think, oh, that's okay. That's, that's within the budget. We could do that. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Uh, thank you, Karen. Thank you. Thanks, Karen. <laughs> uh, you want to follow that up? In my defense, Melon said this was peer pressure that people want me to ask this question. Oh, another one of those. Okay. Hey. Uh -oh. Uh oh. Hi, Andy. Hello, my dear. You had said earlier in in talking about um, being an atheist that that sh shortly thereafter you followed it up with the idea of how a soul informs your acting and i was curious i mean granted i would love to have just a 25 minute conversation with you about religion in general but this is a biggie i can feel this one coming this i can <laughs> i can hear the rumble of it coming down the road <laughs> um so this i'm curious about the way your understanding of something beyond physical not necessarily religion or a theistic concept but something beyond this plane um, informs the way that you do take to acting or have taken to acting as you are tapping into the the life force or whatever of it that you that you had mentioned earlier. This book that I just finished, uh, and it's an acting book. It really is an acting book, and it, and it's based on, on on my core class and how I organized this conservatory program that I created at at, at, at USC. And because because the book evolved, and the book evolved mainly because when I realized that most of the most of my students were coming and and who professed their desire to become actors were not going to be, they're not going to make their living as actors because that's just the way it is. <clears throat> But they are human beings, and that they were coming, and there was another reason, like myself, you know, they, they were coming for a deeper reason. Uh, and so, and my teaching evolved as I this is some this is an understanding that that slowly came to me. And there is a, a there was this great actor, director, theater practitioner by the name of Michael Chekhov. He was, he was Anton Chekhov's nephew, the Anton Chekhov, the great Russian uh, writer and playwright. And his nephew, Michael, was um, by all accounts uh, a magical actor. He was, this, he was transformational in terms of, of how he worked. And he he worked with Stanislavski. He was one of Stanislavski's. Stanislavski, of course, is the keystone of uh, of, of modern uh, actor training uh, and philosophy. He was Stanislavski's favorite actor, and and they parted company at one point. And they parted company over the question of the imagination, because Chekhov became became. Antsy with, with stance. I'm trying to make this as simple as possible, but I'm get into the deep weeds here. That that Stanislavski believed, and 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 he was a brilliant man. He was great, and he progressed to the end of his to, to the end of his life. But at this point in their in, in in his life, he believed in the power of sense memory. That the actor, you know. It works with sensory memory to bring back things that had happened to the actor so that then the actor can through this through sense memory the actor can come up with the emotions that are appropriate for any given moment uh in in, in his or her work Chekhov said this is reductive because there's only so much so many tears that you can cry over your dead dog you know, uh, and after a while, that just is the law of diminishing returns. He said, you're forgetting about the imagination. And so Chekhov's thing was about the imagination. And this is, this is what sort of like keyed me, opened me up. The imagination works, works with, with, the, with the sensory material. And then we see the world the way we see it. We see the, I see the world in a way that nobody else sees it. 
on my point of view, is completely unique. And my, the imagery that I have, I'm sitting here in this room, you know, in Las Vegas, and there's Las Vegas in the mountains behind the window there, and all these good people here, and I'm, you know, shooting my mouth off. And <laughs> this is my reality. This is my imagined reality, because imagination is about the collection of imagery. And the collection of imagery creates a metaphor. And a metaphor is what we, what we need to find in our lives in order to give ourselves a context, a focus. And, the, and, and that is all from the soul. And the soul is the imagination. This is me. This is how I see it. Because I am not like anyone else. <laughs> That's still wonderful. That's still very evocative. Thank you. And it, it's, it's interesting because soul is, is so many different things in the English language and it, ha it, it doesn't necessarily map onto um, religious concepts anymore in the same way that it maybe it once did. Um, when it was, you know, still anima or something, but it, it's so fascinating, especially with folks in your career who step into other people's minds, other people's lives, other people's selves, but we where this, we don't, we can't, that's impossible. I imagine, characters. I imagine that I step into Garrick, but Garrick is just, is just my image of this person called Garrick, who's a Cardassian, whatever that is. Yeah. That's, you know, but I don't step in. It's like stepping into the imagery of that and finding the metaphor of the other, the alien. That's it's quite interesting. What you're saying is quite interesting because um, I'm also following up on Jenna Buck, on what you were saying. Because a lot of actors think of themselves as artists. Um, I don't think of acting as art. I think of acting as artisanal. I think it's like good furniture making. Our job is to deliver messages. And they're not necessarily our messages, but they're compound messages. They're messages from a writer with the director's help, with uh, the producers thrown in and, um, and, what, and, what, and our influences over the years. And we deliver that message as coherently and as honestly as we can. And our job is done. Sometimes it hurts you. Sometimes it is, have no effect. Sometimes it, it means nothing to you, but it doesn't mean it's any less of, a, an import, less of an important message. Now, other people can see what you're doing and say, that's art. Terrific, in which case you maybe have a feather in your cap. Um, but to, when, you, when you start conflating what you're doing with art is a sort of self-aggrandizement in my view. Um, but, and, it, and, it's, and soul, under those circumstances, is art. It's, uh, someone else can say that's a soulful performance in, in the African-American sense, in the blues sense, uh, or, you know, the rhythm, whatever that, if you know what I mean, the jazz sense. Um, that is the art, if an actor has soul. But it's something that someone must tell you. Someone must, observe, to me, as far as I'm concerned, someone must observe that in, of me. The minute it comes out of my mouth that I have a soul in terms of what I'm doing, then I feel, I, I feel like I'm being a bit of an imposter because I'm trying to deliver a message. And every, anything getting in the way of that message, including how important my soul is or the art of what I'm doing, is an, is, is an abstraction, is a distraction. So um, I, I do believe that when I watch Andy perform i i see art i do believe i see soul too um and i think that's also in a kind of para-religious sense the same sort of the same sort of soul a glimpse of the inner a glimpse of the thing that is it is non-corporeal but uh, but divine um it's very complicated fact is to talk about that their own soul their own art because it really is in the eye of the beholder if that makes sense it does. And I'm, I'm fascinated by the language that you use of, of this being something that is given to you, because I think 
that given some of the, the conversation that's happened earlier today, um, that that maps really fascinatingly onto the language of ally, especially in uh, minor, minority communities, that you can't proclaim, well, not can't, you shouldn't proclaim yourself an ally. You should wait for somebody within the community to name that for you. So it's it's fascinating to think about acting as something that you are creating and that you are learning and and doing but that requires someone else to make it soul to make it art to make it um named in the way that that an allyship would which you know both of you have have over and above earned said title in certain communities so to 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 pair those together i think is an interesting um, exposition of the way that you think about your interaction with other people in general. Yeah, I think we're just good messengers. I mean, I think we we we, we are faithful. <laughs> I, I... No, this this it's, it's wonderful. I mean, I could go on for hours about this. I mean, this, this me too. This, this, and this, I could learn something too because this, I'm just, this, this, just I'm feeling away in the dark. Yeah, the <laughs> work this was worth it. And this Thank shit, you, I love Andy. you. I love, love you Batman. so much. Love you back. Okay, thanks everybody. Have a, Have great a lovely safe time. Have some sleep, Those of you in thanks Vegas, for thank up you. Ah, no, it's been great fun. I wouldn't miss it. Bye. 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 Bye.